Today's subject is, it is within. We are told the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, lo, here it is, or there. For the kingdom of God is within you. Can we take this literally? I look out of a sea of faces. I see the room. And everything I see seems so completely independent of my perception of it. Is it really within me? When Blake said, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Is that true? Everything in this past enormous world is the human imagination the only thing vast enough to contain the immensity of space? Then is the human imagination one with the presence we call God? I identify God with human imagination. And in doing so, I close the gap between God and man. Now, if all things are possible to God, I should be able to test this fear. If God truly is my imagination, and all things are possible to him, I should be able to test it. And we are called upon to test it. To test yourself and see. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee, unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. But how to make the test? How should I go about making the test? Well, first of all, I'm going to ask of you what I ask of everyone that I address. Paul said in his letters to the Galatians, let him who is taught share all good things with him who teaches. Now Paul was not asking for any earthly good. That's what he said in the past. He was asking for sincerely good. The results of their experiment. That he in turn could take their stories and tell it to others to encourage their faith. Well, I'm going to ask you to test it. And then share with me the results of your testing. Not only that, your dreams, your visions, I would like to hear them. For that's how God reveals himself to himself in man. We are told, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak with him in a dream. Now, this is what a friend of mine did here recently. This man, I must tell you, is a very successful, I wouldn't say businessman, he's a writer. But he's always busy writing for pictures, writing for TV, and his income is enormous. He never misses a meeting in L.A. And here recently, he sent me this letter. He said, you've asked me to share with you any experience of mine, such as a vision, a dream, or my practical down-to-earth experiences in the application of this principle. Well, here is a dream. He said, first of all, I must preface the dream. And then he asked me in his letter if I was familiar with Barclay Square, where the central character tries to convince the girl that he can move from one century to another the 20th century to the 18th century. And then he likens it to someone on a river. And his destination is around the bend. His present is where he is on the boat. His future is around the bend. But someone elevated above the earth, having a view of both sides of the river, would see the man's future and his present 
as present. Where that man is going and where he is will be present to the one elevated. For he said, my dream began in this manner. I was the observer from above. I looked down and I saw infinite possibilities of man. You couldn't conceive of a plot, whether the plot of a tragedy or some glorious plot, some horrible thing or some marvelous thing, but every conceivable plot that man could ever conceive, everyone was present worked out in the most minute detail. And strangely enough, they were all contained in a prone man. There is the form of a prone man. And we said, don't ask me how infinite things, as consciousness, infinite possibilities could be limited by the form of a man. But there it was. I'm only telling you what I experienced. Did I contemplated this? It was the deadest thing I had ever seen. And yet I shouldn't use the word dead. Because something that is dead suggests it must have lived. It's a previous life to it. It is now dead. So it's simply an inanimate thing. I looked at it. And then I began to awake on Sunset Boulevard, opposite Ralph's supermarket. People were on the sidewalks. There were cars on the street. But everything was frozen. But everything was frozen. Three-dimensional, but frozen. And I knew that I alone could animate them. As I knew that, I myself was frozen. I looked at myself, I'm just like the others, all frozen. And I knew only as I became alive would they become alive. And so I took a step. And I seemed to pass through an invisible curtain. At that very moment of taking the step, everyone became alive. And began to move the sound, the noise, the action, everything. And I knew there was something I was trying to remember. What is it I am trying to remember? I kept on walking. I must have gone a block. It seemed like a normal walk, the kind of walk I take every day. And everything is alive and independent of me. And then I remembered. As I remembered, I turned around and looked. And changed the focus of my attention and place it back about. And everything once more became frozen and lifeless. From this exalted state, I remembered I didn't talk to them. And for some strange reason, I wanted to speak with people. And at that moment, I found myself in the living room where a party was in progress. But they were frozen. And as I ended, I was frozen. And I wondered, am I the host? Am I the guest? They all seem to know me, and I don't know one of them. And for a moment, I panicked. For I knew the party would come to an end, and I didn't know where to go. So I remembered. I completely forgot one second before, as I became involved in the party. Then I'm trying to remember something. I remembered the Sunset Boulevard experience. Remembering that and how I escaped from it, I walked over to a seat, a chair. I sat down and closed my eyes. And then I changed the focus of my attention. I once more placed it not here with the party, but above. I open my eyes, and they're all frozen. Everyone is frozen. And then I felt myself once more above. At this exalted state, I looked way down, and here is myself on a bed. 
and I had what I considered a wonderful idea. Now I know I can change, move myself from its present state into the most desirable state that I would like to experience. And then I realized how impossible that would be. From this level, I can't change any state. These states are permanent. I would have to go down and identify myself with that dream. And from that level, once more, play the game. And so at that moment, I began to awake. I'm on my bed. And I have no knowledge of the dream. To me, it's 6.30 in the morning, and I can conceive that I have a dream. I went to my library and started to make a recording of your last lecture. And something you said triggered the dream. And it all came back in detail that I've just told you. Then I said, did I dream it last night? Or did I dream it long, long, long ago? I don't know. But however, it thrilled me. And so I thought I'd share it with you. Then at the very end, to make it a light letter, he said, I went to my doctor and he said, in fact, he congratulated me on my rapid physical recovery. And he asked me if I'd done something, or and if so, tell him all about it. So I said, I did it all in my imagination. I imagine I was in your office and you were saying to me exactly what you said. And then I began to explain to him how imagination works, that imagination creates reality. He said to me in an elderly philosophical manner, you know, my wife thinks things like that. Wasn't very flattering. But he said, this is a strange experience. We were out driving recently on a Sunday afternoon and the radio was turned in to a ball game. And this man is coming to bat and I dislike him. And I say to my wife, he shouldn't be in the big league. He can't hit, he can't catch, and he can't run. What right has he playing in the big league? And she said to me, you shouldn't think things like that. You should think nice things about him and see him doing wonderful things. He said, all right, I will. I'll see him hit a home run. He steps to the plate and the first ball pitched, he belts it into the bleachers. And then said he to his wife, I'll never do that again. It's too fast. <laughs> But I must tell you, the lecture that triggered the memory of his dream. For here we all are seated in this room and we think we are here and completely this. And what his dream signifies, we will not take to heart. And yet you're the animating power of the universe. The whole vast world is moving around you because you're identified with the present state. Well, the thing he began to recall was this. I found myself in dream, but not knowing that it was a dream. I found myself on a crowded subway train in New York City. I was talking to my friend David, but the train was literally crowded to the gunners. I heard the voice of the conductor saying, please, do not press against the doors, they may spring. But the people couldn't help it. But in spite of the crowd, I could see them individually, distinctly. And the ladies were more beautiful than each other. I mean, they're all beautiful and beautifully gowned. And I turned to my friend, David. I said, David, how can I believe, how can you believe that all that we behold, though it appears without, it is within in our imagination. And this whole vast world is simply a shadow. How could these lovely ladies be in me and the train? And the train was as long as the station allowed. Well, he agreed you couldn't possibly on this level accept it. Then the train stopped and we got off. Walked up the stairs to the 
plaza. Then he said to me, you're going via the post office, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, do me a favor and post these letters for me. I took the letters and said, are they properly stamped and addressed? And I casually, not because I was curious who he's writing, just to see that they were properly stamped. I waved goodbye to him and turned in the direction of the post office. And he went the opposite direction. And I found myself waking. Were they not in me? So what conclusion can I reach? Objectivity and subjectivity are fully determined for the individual by the level on which his consciousness is focused. On reflection, it's subjective. When I was actually having the experience, it wasn't subjective. It was objective. Only when I woke and reflected upon the experience that I refer to it as a subjective experience. This is now objective. An hour from now, if you think of this room and the meeting, to you it will be a subjective experience, a memory image. So I say, everything is truly within. Now you can test it. You take a dream, a daydream, or something you want for yourself, or something you want for another. And you represent to yourself a scene, which if true implies the fulfillment of that dream. You like to do this, that, and the other. And so you construct a scene. Any kind of a scene imply the fulfillment of your desire. And then to the degree that you are self-persuaded of the reality of that imaginal act, it will become fact in your world. I could tell you unnumbered stories to support that claim. It's not theory of me anymore. This is fact based upon experience. So when we are told in the book of Luke, the kingdom of God is within you. You can take it literally. These garments that you and I wear are parts of the eternal structure of the universe. You are wearing the garment as an act to wear the costume. You are not the garment you wear. You're doing this for a purpose, a heavenly purpose, but you are not these garments. You are that being that my friend discovered who sees it from above. And to see this universe from above is so completely unlike what it appears to be seen from this angle. It's not this way at all. But you come down into this world of death for a purpose. Now, Blake made this observation, and he claims he did not write it from his conscious reasoning mind, that the words were dictated by the spirit of love. Well, God is love. Therefore, if the spirit of love dictated the words of Jerusalem, then it's God dictating it. And in this he said, those in great eternity who contemplate on love, or rather contemplate on death, said this. What seems to be is to those to whom it seems to be, even of torments, despair, and eternal death. But divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Jesus. Now, that's something that man can't grasp on this level. But I tell you, it is true. To stand in the presence of the risen Christ and commune with him face to face and voice to voice, then to have love, his infinite love, embrace you. And as he embraces you, you fuse with him without loss of identity, no change in your identity, and yet you are one with the body of Christ. And then he sends you. And he can't send you without himself because you're one with him. There's no divorcement, no separation from that moment on. So when he makes the statement, divine mercy steps beyond and redeems man in the body of Christ. 
So in my last little pamphlet, I made this statement, and I made it from experience. That you and I are resurrected one by one to unite into a single man who is God. So here is a reflection that he saw in his dream. A man prone, containing infinity, and the deadest thing he'd ever seen. God places a limitation and then takes upon himself that limitation and reaches in this act the very limit of contraction that he may then expand beyond what he was. He takes upon himself the limit of opacity and then begins to expand and there's no limit to translucence, to transparency. This is the world called the world of death. But while we are in it, and we ourselves are animating it, we can take any state we desire. There are infinite number of states. You can be in a poor state or a wealthy state. You're no better off as far as the height goes because one is poor and one is wealthy. Not from a spiritual point of view. But while you're in the world of Caesar, why not be comfortable? Why not take a state that cushions and comforts. And so you can take a state of affluence if you know what it would be like. Were you affluent? Assume that you are and see the world as you would see it were it true. And then, I, I, I would say accept it. Believe in the reality of that unseen imaginal act. And if you do, it will come to pass. Because the whole vast world really is within you. I don't care what others will tell you. It's all within you. And everyone moving in your world moves because of you. William James made the statement that the greatest revolution in his time was the discovery that man, by changing the inner attitudes of his mind, could change the outer aspects of his life. Now, James belongs to our generation, the century. He's gone from the world, but he was the great educator of the 20th century. And he said the greatest revolution in his time was this discovery. Well, the great book of books, the Bible, makes that statement. Not as James made it, but how would you interpret this? Whatever you desire, believe that you have received it, and you will. Isn't that the one condition imposed upon me or you is to persuade self that we have it? How can I persuade myself when at the moment reason denies it and my senses deny it? But James said he could change the inner attitudes of his mind. Can anyone stop you from changing your attitude towards the speaker? You may like him or dislike him. And if your dislike of him causes him to act, to confirm your dislike, and you like the dislike, well then keep it up. If you don't like that reaction, you could change your attitude towards him, and he automatically and unknowingly would act in the way that you would like. And you can make it with any person in this world. So if I am that free, but I don't have to get your permission to hold an opinion of you, but I can hold it regardless of you. And if I hold it and persuade myself of the reality of that opinion of you, and you conform to it, am I not free? I am free to entertain any thought, and if I am, and it produces results, well then I'm a free person, even in the world of Caesar. So here, I do hope that I have persuaded you that the whole vast world, though you seem so small and insignificant to yourself, the whole vast universe is really within you. And so you can take it this day and test it. You're invited to test it. But when you get the results, share it with me. Tell me about it. Write me a letter and explain what you did and how it worked. And if you are blessed this night with a vision, 
I would love to hear it. For God makes himself known to man in vision. And he speaks with a man through a dream. Don't try to interpret the dream. Tell me just what happened. My friend did not attempt to interpret it. He told me exactly what happened when my lecture that he was about to record triggered the memory of the dream. But all through his experiences, what lesson he was learning was this. I have forgotten. I must remember. If everyone could now persuade themselves you're trying to remember something, you lost the memory of it when you came this low in the scale. And you're trying to remember. What he was trying to remember was that exalted position where he saw the whole thing as dead. And he came down into the body of death and completely forgot who he really was. And people are shocked when you tell them that they are Christ. All ends run true to origins. If my origin is God, my aim must be God. As the poet said, you see yonder fields, the sesame was sesame. The corn was corn. The silence and the darkness knew, and so is a man's fate born. If I believe what scientists tell me, that my origin is a worm, my end is a worm. If I believe the Bible and my origin is God, my end is God. And I don't have to choose that anymore. I know that from experience. I don't have to speculate about the risen Christ. I don't have to speculate about God being loved. I stood in the presence of God and his infinite love. I'm not bending my head when I say God is man. As Blake said, thou art a man. God is no more. Thy own humanity learn to adore. God appears and God is light to those poor souls who dwell in night. But does a human form display to those who dwell in realms of day? So here, you're wearing the form of God. You are God. He gave you his name. And the name that he reveals to the whole vast world, if he'll take it, is I am. So that's my name forever. It'll be known, I'll be known by it throughout all generations. But we don't stop there. We say, I am John, a poor John, an unknown John, an unwanted John. And these are the limitations and the restrictions we put upon the name of God. But if I will remember the name, I will glorify the name. And only put upon it that which is noble, that which is free. And if I did it, I would walk in that light. So, do me a favor and try it. Try it, and I promise you from my own experience that you'll get the results. You won't have to hound anyone in this world, but no one. Here's a simple little story. Two weeks ago, just before I closed. I was about to close, and my wife said to me, you know, here's a little unfinished business. A friend of ours owes you some money. You've never asked him for it. You've never written. You've never mentioned it to anyone, but he owes you the money. You're closing up for the entire summer. You will not be here until late fall. I don't think it's fair to him, fair to you, fair to me, that he continues indefinitely without ever mentioning the fact that he owes you the money. I said, all right, you want the money? He said, yes. I said, all right, I will do it in my own way. I will not ask him for it. I will not write him for it. I will not phone him for it. But I will do it in my own way of imagination. So I imagined. First of all, he had the money. You can't get it from someone who has the money. So I first of all assumed he had it. 
And then I went beyond that. You can have money and be unwilling to pay debts, you know. You may have millions and owe the grocery store and still won't pay it. So I, first of all, saw him with money, lots of money. And then I saw him willing and eager to pay me. And then I received from him whatever he owed me. This I did on Wednesday. On Friday, the phone rang about 4.30. It was my friend. He hadn't called me in over a year. He said, are you busy tonight? I said, yes, I'm lecturing tonight. He said, that's right, it's Friday night. Well, my wife and I will come to the meeting tonight. It's perfectly all right. So he came to the meeting. After the meeting, he said, you ride home with me. And Bill, who's my wife, she'll go home with the one who brought you. And my wife will go with you, with her. So we went over to the parking lot. And he always drove an old jalopy. Something falling apart. But I saw nothing like that in the lot. And he took me over towards this wonderful Chrysler, the New Yorker model, with everything in it that money could buy. But he drove me home. A new car was under a thousand miles. Not a word was said on the way home about money. Not a word was said at home. The one who drove my wife and his wife home left about quarter of eleven. And then five minutes later, she opened her purse and said, Neville, this is long, long overdue, but I think you'll find it in order, and handed me a check for $1,200. I never asked for it. Never once in the five years he's owed it to me did I ever breathe it. And he gave me, she gave me $1,200. This is how it works. If you believe in the reality, of your own wonderful imaginal acts. It came out of the nowhere. And now he has money. Things rolled in for him. He's completely out of debt and free of that feeling of owing friends money over so many, many years. So try it and then share with me the results of your experiment. And now, I think I'm going to ask my friends, the ushers, to pass among you. Should we take everything seriously or only certain ones, and how do we distinguish the difference? Did you hear the question? Should we take every dream seriously or only a few, and how will we distinguish the difference between the significant dream and just an ordinary dream. But first of all, every dream is a communication from God. Every dream has meaning. But we are past masters at misinterpreting the dream. Quite often we need the help of someone who understands the universal language of symbolism. And there is a universal language of symbolism. But if, for instance, I had a dream concerning a pig, it doesn't mean I'm going to have roast pork for dinner. A pig is a universal symbol of the Redeemer of the universe. And the Redeemer and the Creator are one. So follow the reasoning behind the pig. What was it in the story of the pig? I had that dream. Here was this little pig in an enormous interior where they were displaying flowers and plants, all kinds of vegetation. And just at closing time, I noticed there's a little pig, a little rut. And so seeing no one around, I picked him up and placed him on something what, as tall as this. And then I took some flowers, I took some uh, green leaves and made a bed for him. And I also knew that it may not be the best food for him, but he could survive on flowers and leaves until someone opened the place the next day. And then as happens in dreams, it just quickly shifted. And now I'm on the inside of an enormous supermarket. And looking down, here's the pig. And the pig is a tall, thin, rangy fellow, quite thin, 
But I found him with a little tiny runt. And then I looked at him. I knew he was the same pig. And I said to my daughter, Vicky, I said, Vicky, get me some crackers for the pig. And she said, I haven't any money, Daddy. I said, all this belongs to us. Ask no favors, go and take it. Take some crackers. Meanwhile, I started needing something to feed him. And my brother Victor came by and he said, what are you doing? I'm getting some food for my pig. And then he added some very thick looking gravy, three heaping uh, handfuls. I thanked him and I started to complete this kneading. And then my daughter went over to a huge pyramid of crackers and she pulled one from the base, which unbalanced the entire picture and they all fell. As they fell, it revealed a little candle about four inches tall. And the candle was lit. And I said to her, that's my candle. And the words from scripture came into my mind. The words of Job and the words of Proverbs. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And when his candle shines upon my forehead, by its light, I walk through darkness. So I said to Vicky, do not put the crackers back. That's lit now. It must never be hid again. Never be put under a bed, under a bushel, under anything. Now that that light is lit, it must remain lit. And then I woke. Well, here is the pig, the universal symbol of the Redeemer. But I have found that imagining creates reality. I'm told it. It isn't a day in my life I don't have opportunities to exercise it. The thinness of the pig revealed to me I had not been as faithful to the feeding of Christ as I should have been. He symbolized Christ. And I knew how to feed him by exercising my imagination lovingly on behalf of others. When I saw the opportunity to help and didn't exercise my imagination lovingly on behalf of the other who needed help, I didn't feed him. I am feeding Christ every time I exercise my imagination in a loving manner. So that's the interpretation of that dream. If I didn't know the language of symbolism, I would have wondered, what am I dreaming about a pig? And the whole thing would have seemed so stupid. Yet that was communicating to me my lack of exercising what I knew. Not everyone knows imagining creates reality, so you can't judge them. But if you know it and you don't exercise it, you are not feeding Christ. Any other questions, please? Rock, water, and wine, we find it all through the Bible. The rock would be the most literal translation of the scripture. The most literal. Water is when you see the psychological meaning behind the story. So you, from that literal story, you bring forth water. You're told in the book of Genesis, he came into the field and the well was covered with a rock, a stone. He rolled away the stone and watered the sheep and then he rolled it back again. So every man comes to the rock, which is the Bible, the rock of God. He sees, if he knows how to read, he can read it. But he has to turn it into water. So he turns stone into water, getting the psychological meaning of the story. His use of that story, psychologically, converts water into wine. So we are told in Timothy's letter, Paul, Paul's letter to Timothy, drink no more water, use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your many infirmities. In other words, don't completely absorb the psychological meaning all day long and never apply it. Drink a little wine now. Now, if you take that literally, you may go and get blasted. <laughs> but he doesn't mean it that way. He means take what you know of the truth and use it. The use of it turns the water into wine. I can't get both.
You know, I, I'm not hearing you correctly. It's a child, you say? Or a child? Well, to be a child is the greatest of all significance. A child is something created. Christ is always symbolized as the child. Always the child. Christ is the creative power and the wisdom of God. And that power is always personified as a child. Always. In the 8th chapter of Proverbs. And when he created the world, before he brought forth anything, I stood beside him as a little child. And I was daily his delight. For I am his creative power, his wisdom. He who finds me finds life. He who misses me injures himself. He who hates me loves death. And so you find the little child. The day will come, you'll all bring forth the Christ child. Everyone will give birth to Christ and bring forth that power of God wrapped in swaddling clothes in the form of a little babe. To me, it's uh, self-explanatory. You go to bed worried about something, and you hear a voice of authority asking you, what are you worrying about? And telling you not to worry, and reveals itself in two glorious eyes. And you are concerned? No. Look upon that as the most wonderful symbol of help. But let us get off the dreams now. And yet, No, I wouldn't say that anyone stays in it. In the course of a day, you and I change state after state after state, numberless states in the course of a day. But we do have one to which we return constantly. That's where we live. That state, that emotion to which we most often return, constitutes the true self, the true state. That's the one that's always hatching out. If I don't like the fruit that it bears, I should do something about planting a new kind of a state or tree. But the individual planting, for instance, like the money I got from my friend, <clears throat> I did it on Wednesday, he gave it to me on Friday. In the interval, I didn't do it again, never thought of it again. My wife asked me to do it for it was unfinished business, so I did it. Well, now, the Bible teaches that the vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait. For it is sure, and it will not be late. Not be late for itself. No two impregnations have the same interval of time between conception and birth. A child, if it be human, takes nine months. A horse takes 12. A chicken takes three, three weeks. And so seeds have their different intervals of time. That's true also of concepts. Man can conceive himself to be this, that, or the other. And then that interval between the conception and its birth is determined by the nature of the conception. Any other questions? Yeah, but, but you could see this result in your imagination and you let it go. Always go to the end. The end is where we begin. What would it be like were it true? That's the end, isn't it? I have no concern with the means. I go to the end. And the end determines the means. He said, I have ways and means you know not of my ways of past finding out. So all we're concerned with here is the end. Going to the end, remaining faithful for one moment to get the reaction, the thrill, that emotion that comes with success, and then drop it. 